Well, I hate to break up this party, but it's, uh, it's time we got started. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Concord this morning. It's good to have those of you here in the building with us today that have joined us. We thank you, those that are online. It's good to have you know you're out there, you're supporting in prayer. And uh, we're looking forward to a, a good day today. We're going to be reading in Psalm 61. If you would join... And uh, I'll read the odd verse, and you come back on the even verse. Excuse me? Uno momento. Uno momento, por favor. <laughs> We're trying to get it. Technology, folks. It's, you know, they say if anything's going to go wrong in, at, at, at a meeting, it's going to be, first thing is going to be the sound system. But now that we've gotten into a lot of the video stuff, it's going to be the sound system and the video. <laughs> so. Hear my cry, O oh God. <laughs> Murphy's in the building today. If you have your Bible, which I hope you do when you come to Calvary Chapel, you can find us uh, Psalms 61. It's a short one, so you're not going to be reading a whole lot. I'm not reading a whole lot either, but I'll give you just a second to look that up. I'll start with the first verse. Somebody give a Bible to Brit up there so she can follow along. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. For you have been the shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who, you, who fear your name. He shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. This morning as we go to prayer, we want to pray for those who are on our, our prayer chain. And uh, I had a chance to, to stop by and see Jeff this week, and he's been, he's really been sick. And uh, I told him I would mention him in prayer today to lift him up. And uh, also I was talking to a lady, a special friend. Uh, her father's in real bad condition. And uh, he asked that we would remember this unspoken request in prayer. And those, there are probably many of those around that, that we don't mention. And uh, I, I just want you to know that this is a praying church, that we lift, these, the, we lift these petitions up, and God knows. God knows our hearts. He knows who we're, we're praying about, even though we don't mention a name. You know, they, the Bible talks about him. The Holy Spirit understands our groanings and our moanings. There's times when we're so under an issue that we cannot verbalize. We just weep and cry and moan. But the Holy Spirit understands that language. He knows our heart. So today, let's lift our hearts in prayer and, and uh, thank the Lord for those who are here and those who have joined us online. 
Father, it's so good to be with the family today. And we pray as we, as we sit under the uh, lesson today by Pastor that you would speak through him to our hearts. It's an interesting lesson today. And Father, shine your light upon the things we need to see and understand and pour them into our buckets so that we can take them with us and help us to take that bucket and pour it out as we go this week with others. We pray today for Jeff that you would touch him, strengthen him, and give him a, a good health so he can get back with us. And this special unspoken request, go to that place right now where the, the, the person that is in much need for prayer, touch their need. Speak them if it's healing, heal them. If it's a spiritual need, speak, speak to their spiritual life and heal their spiritual life. And Father, we pray for our first responders today. We pray that you'd watch over them and keep them safe. For our people on the front lines fighting in the battles, being this, still in this war over in Europe, oh, Father, bring peace. We pray for our leadership in our country. It just seems that things get darker and darker every day. We pray that your light of, of Holy Spirit would shine upon our country once again. Bring us to our knees. Bring us revival. Start it in me. I need revival in my own heart, Father. I'm asking for me to be more attentive to you and what you would have for me. Again, raise our pastor up today as he gives the lesson that you've laid on his heart. Thank you again for all you do for us, for all you give us. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen and amen. Bob, we refer to that to the, as the perversity of inanimate objects, microphones and, and things such as that. In case you were wondering, uh, there's a very good reason why things were messing up this morning. And that reason is I'm talking about him this morning. And I don't think he likes it. So just bear with me. <laughs> huh? No, he doesn't like it when I talk bad about him. But know this, just as you were saying with conflicts across the world and such, Satan is alive and he's doing very well on this earth, guys. And in case you don't believe it, listen very carefully. We're continuing on from our last section of 2 Corinthians in chapters 10 through 13. We're currently in chapter 11, and we'll be looking at verses 5 through 14 this morning. But one of the things that we notice is happening is that Paul's not backing down in any stretch of the imagination. He's still coming down hard on the Corinthians. In chapter 10, he compared the characteristics of these false teachers, leaders with the, the doctrine and the attitudes and the practices of the true apostles, just to, you can get an understanding of where they each are coming from. And he encourages those at Corinth to apply the doctrines and the principles that they have been taught by him to deal with these false teachers. And then at the end of chapter 10, Paul writes, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And so glories, or another way of saying it, if him who boasts, or he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. So is it okay to boast? Yes. As long as you boast about the right things. And Paul is going to boast about two right things in chapter 11. They, the Corinthians, were his jealousy and his jeopardy. And we talk about his jealousy and then the simplicity we're to have in Christ. And we understand or come to the understanding that Paul had a godly jealousy for the Corinthians. And we talked about this before. Uh, not of the Corinthians, but for the Corinthians. And that word for, that little three-letter word, makes a, a huge difference. He was not jealous of them or of the false teachers who they were now 
by the way following. He was not jealous of them or of those teachers, but and the reason why is because that kind of jealousy of them or of the false teachers is really selfish and it's destructive. It doesn't accomplish anything that the Lord would want accomplished. But that's not where Paul was coming from. He was jealous for them. It was a selfless, constructive jealousy that really truly had their best interest in mind. And that's what the Lord wants to do in your life and my life. He loves to take a hold of our twisted, warped life that's eaten up with jealousy and then fill it with the Holy Spirit jealousy. And instead of your being jealous of people, you become jealous for them, wanting them to grow in the grace and the knowledge, first of all, to come to Jesus Christ, but to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so... In that, you become jealous for them. You live with one great burning motive. That that is that others might be blessed. That others might be helped on their journey. On this path that we're traveling on. That they might be encouraged. God takes hold of the tongue that has been so critical. Or maybe perhaps unkind in its conversation. And he gives a new tongue that speaks with love, gentleness, grace, grace and mercy. And then Paul talking about the simplicity. So important that simplicity that we not get complicated to the point where we become distracted, off course if you would, or deceived. And so Paul says, I fear lest Satan should corrupt your minds from that simplicity that is toward Christ. In other words, Our attitude, which is the governing bond of everything else towards the Lord, is to be utterly, completely simple. What is the simplicity that is toward Christ? I'll tell you what it is. It is a faith that looks to Christ crucified and risen exclusively as the source of salvation and the source of life. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Keep the main thing, the main thing. And so we pick up with this thought on the church at Corinth, buying into these false teachers and these false teachers seeking to rip off the body of Christ. And Paul begins to further develop it in verse 5, where he says, For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. In the original language, the idea behind the phrase, most eminent apostles is like extra super duty duty apostles. Extra super duper. Special. Like special forces. But Paul, at this point, is no country bumpkin, as they might presume. And although Paul, Paul would claim to be a, a, the least of the apostles, would also claim to be the chief of the sinners, of all sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15. He doesn't do that here. Here, he's most likely writing sarcastically. And he's calling on these false apostles, these eminent ones, if you would, or distinguished ones, so-called in their own estimation. And he goes on to say, I'm not at all inferior to you guys. You're not better. You think you're better, but you're not better. Whoever these most eminent apostles are, Paul will not claim to be less than what they are. Verse 6, Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. So Paul, according to the standards of Greek rhetoric, he was untrained in speech. In his day, the ability to speak in a polished and a sophisticated, entertaining manner was a very popular thing. It was something that was sought out. And people gathered to those that were able to do that. These other most eminent apostles that the Corinthian Christians, the uh, Corinthian church loved so much, they were also able to speak in this style and in this way. But Paul, he for whatever reason was either unable or unwilling to preach in this manner. However, it didn't matter to Paul. 
Because he wasn't concerned with meeting people's standards for a polished and entertaining speaker. He wasn't so concerned about that. The thing he was concerned about was faithfully preaching the gospel. Faithfully preaching the word of God. That's what was important to him. So Paul says, my speech might be a little bit rough, but not my knowledge. While at a dinner party, asked to quote the 23rd Psalm, the famous Shakespearean actor articulated each and every phrase perfectly. Then the host of the party asked his pastor, who was also in attendance, to quote the same psalm. The pastor lacked the rhythmic cadence. He lacked the powerful voice. And he lacked the smooth speech. All he had was a tear rolling down his cheek. And the actor said, I know the psalm, but this man knows the shepherd. I know the psalm, but this man knows the shepherd, the master. Who do you know? Because see, this was the difference between the preaching of Paul and the preaching of these most eminent apostles. Paul knew the shepherd. Paul knew Jesus. And he said, you know, I might not match up to your favorite speakers or your profound teachers that you dial into. And I may not measure up in speech, but I do in knowledge because I know him. And thus, because he knew him, he preached the gospel with power. So given that, perhaps he was a bit untrained. But notice verse 6 goes on to say, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. The things that are important, more important than being able to have a polished speech, a polished sermon. You know, Paul was saying that's not the thing that is the, of the most importance. The thing of most importance is who do you know? Who do you know? Do you know the master? Do you know the shepherd? Paul couldn't or wouldn't give the Corinthian Christians the polished and entertaining preacher that they sought after. But he would give them himself. We've been thoroughly manifested among you. We gave it all. We gave everything we could give for you and to you. And he thoroughly, it says, manifested or demonstrated himself among the Corinthian Christians in how many things? It says in all things, doesn't it? In all things. He wasn't a polished speaker according to the standards of his day, but he was an honest and transparent speaker. And so verse 7 says, Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge. This is something else that the Corinthian Christians were having a hard time with Paul because he didn't charge. The super apostles were exceedingly wealthy. Why? Because they charged exorbitant speaking fees in order to come and share. But Paul, on the other hand, tells us that he didn't charge anything. In the culture that day, the public speaker didn't take money for his speaking. He was often disregarded as a poor speaker with worthless teaching. They were thought of as strictly amateurs. But Paul didn't care about the opinion of others when it came to preaching the gospel free of charge. The Corinthian Christians who despised Paul were so worldly in their thinking that they actually thought Paul might be in sin because he preached the gospel of God to them free of charge. Duh! Free of charge they did. So how did he support himself? Notice verse 8. I robbed of the churches. <laughs> now I think sometimes that Paul has a sense of humor, but this may not be the time that he was exercising it. In the classic Greek, this word was used for stripping a dead soldier of his armor, which would make this even more funny. But that's not what Paul's doing. He was refer referring here to the fact that he received support from Christians in other cities during his time in Corinth. He could say he robbed those other churches in the sense 
that by right, the Corinthian Christians should have been supporting him when he was ministering to their spiritual needs. 1 Corinthians 9, 4-11. But instead of that happening and taking place, Paul was you know, a burden to no one among the Christians there at Corinth. Not one. Notice verse 9. And when I was present with you, and in need, I was burden, a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. I'm going to continue to do this. Paul tells them that the others were supporting him in his ministry in order that he wouldn't be a burden to them financially. So you guys, you know, it's like even though you should be and you have an obligation to, you don't have to. And you notice verse 10 goes on to say, as the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. So in the area where they were sending Paul money and support and encouraging him, Paul says, hey, you know what? I'm going to keep reminding you that I have not taken a penny from you. And he wasn't going to rub their face in it or anything like that. But he really felt like because they were going after the false teachers and after the false doctrine, that he needed to make sure that they understood what was going on. Paul, as a true apostle, though, could boast. He could boast that he took no money from them and that he was more interested in the integrity of the message than of his own needs. And we don't see that a lot today. You know, a lot of these television preachers and pastors and, and such and those that are out there, you know, they're not necessarily doing it for the purest of motives. And Paul would say here at this point, this is what I'm boasting of. I'm more interested in the integrity of the message than in his own needs. They didn't want the message getting caught up in this whole thing. As, as it would and as it would be damaged and as it would become perhaps rendered ineffective. Why? Verse 11, notice. Why? Because I don't love you. God knows. That's the accusation. Some were saying that, Paul, if you really loved us, you would charge us. What? And Paul basically answered, duh. God knows I love you. You see, it was an embarrassment to these Corinthian Christians that Paul would boast in his weakness, would boast in his unimpressive image and his presentation, his speech. You know, instead, it should have been, they think, they think, the Corinthian Christians, hey, we've got an image to uphold. We've got, you know... Uh, the little things that we do and the things that impress people, that we're spiritual people. You know, they were doing the whole thing of demanding to be able to do what they wanted to do because we have liberty and we're more mature. And they were looking at themselves as being more mature, but Paul says, no, that's not true. No, he did it because of his great love for them and his desire to help them find a way to bring them back from their worldly thinking. They were in a worldly jam, guys. It's not about being conformed to the world, is it? It's about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renew your mind, guys. Not This is what the Corinthian Christians were doing. They were conforming themselves to the world. Paul's desire was to expose, though, these most imminent, apostles as the frauds that they are. And so if, if it took a biting sarcasm or if it took an embarrassing kind of a, a, a phraseology, the Corinthian Christians, you know, to, to expose them for what they were, Paul was going to do it. He wasn't going to mess around. He was going to lay it out there on the table for all of them to know where his heart was at and what he felt. And they, they did. They, they kind of were embarrassed by Paul. You know, I don't know. Think about him. Hooked nose, bent back. You know, just not, appearance-wise, not the, not, the, not the Joel Osteen kind. You know what I mean? It's like, he didn't have that, that polished look 
And that polished presentation, you know, that polished sales pitch, if you would. But what I do, verse 12, I will also continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. Paul tells them, listen, I'm not going to charge you and I dare these false teachers to follow my lead. So he ups the ante a little bit and says, come on, you do the same. There have been times in this ministry as well as other ministries that I've been involved in where we didn't have the money to support the ministers. And it's really interesting what happens in those kinds of situations. Because there's some that keep serving. They keep teaching. They keep working. And they keep doing whatever they're called to do. But then there's others that fade away. Jesus called them hirelings. In John chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. I believe, guys, that God almost inevitably allows men and women to be tested in this way. He allows that. And He does it to allow them to see whether what they're doing is merely a job or is really, truly a calling on their life. Something that they would do whether or not they were financially supported. Would they do that? Although Paul sometimes had support from Macedonia, we know from the book of Acts that during this time he would support himself by making tents in order that he could teach the word at nights or in the afternoon. He said in Philippians chapter 4 verse 12, I know how to abound And how to be a base. I'm just going to keep doing that. What I've been called to do. And for some of you guys. Not to boast. But for some of you that have been around for. You know the length of the duration if you would. Of the the church here at Calvary Chapel Concord. You know that for the first four or five years. I threw about a little over 400 newspapers every morning. In order to make ends meet. It wasn't because, you know, I I felt like I should go out and demand. But I was taught in ministry that that wasn't the thing that decided whether or not that I was going to be ministering to a group of people that the Lord would draw out. Now, I didn't do it for those reasons. Verse 13, he says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And here at this point, Paul becomes even more direct. Without sarcasm, he plainly calls his detractors in Corinth, or at least the leaders among them, he calls them false prophets or false apostles, deceitful workers. They were clearly there in Paul's days, and they're with us today as well. False apostles are those who transform themselves into apostles of Christ. Now, in fact, no one can transform themselves into a true apostles of Christ. It is only a calling from God. The commentator Matthew Poole, Poole he puts it this way. He says, there, they were never apostles of Christ, only they put themselves into such a shape and form that they might have more advantage to deceive. And Paul will explain in the following sentence, those who transform themselves are more like Satan than they are like God. And so with that, notice verse 14. He says, and no wonder. It's no wonder that things are this way. It's no wonder that you come in this appearance or that you seek after these things. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Transforms, the Greek, is to change in fashion or appearance, changing the outward form. In other words, what Satan looked like on the outside isn't what he looks like on the inside, this angel of light. And one of Satan's names is Lucifer. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 16. Or Lucifer, which means light bearer. 
But Satan was one of God's most beautiful creations. Ezekiel 28. Satan had beauty. He's not the ugly picture that we think, nor the red suit with horns. No, Satan himself is transformed, it tells us, into an angel of light. Now, when seen in the context of the whole word of God, and when seen in the light of the current events that we are seeing taking place, these words, perhaps more than any other words given, expose the true nature of, of the battle in which you and I are engaged. God help us to understand like we have never understood before the fight that we are in and the awful grip that Satan has on the world at this time. And the one hope that yet remains for those who yet belong to him rests in that as well. But please don't make the mistake of thinking Satan's not real or minimalizing him. He's not just an influence or an evil thing. He's a person who is just as real as Jesus Christ. And if we accept the personality of Christ as it's given in the Word of God, we also have to accept the personality of the devil upon the same evidence given. Isaiah chapter 14 tells us that Satan was revealed as one of God's heavenly hosts long before the existence of life on this planet. That he set himself against the will of God. And he said, I will ascend unto heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And so before there was rebellion on earth, there was a revolt in heaven. He then stepped into the record of human history as the serpent, seeking to snare the human race into his purpose of becoming self-centered, self-sufficient, and independent of God. Genesis chapter 3. And he was successful. And ever since then, every life born has been born subject to that principle of life, subject to that sin nature. We also see Satan as one who has access to the throne of God. And we see that in Job chapter 1 and in verse 6. We then find him face to face combating with Jesus. The Son of God. And in that com- combat or that conflict that they experience, we see the offer of all the kingdoms of this world if he would just worship him. Just acknowledge that there is a possibility of life that can be lived by man apart from a relationship with God. But we know our Lord said no way, no how. Luke chapter 4. Now, it's generally said that Satan has three forms under which he tempts us and tempts man. The first is the subtle serpent. The second is the roaring lion. And the third is the angel of light. As that angel of light, he often persuades men to do things in the name of religion, which actually seek to destroy it and do it damage. In the form of persecution, like a lion, he has ravaged the heritage of the Lord. And by means of our senses and passions, as the subtle one, he is frequently deceiving us so that often the workings of the corrupt nature are mistaken for the operations of the Spirit of God. We see this work going on and going forth. Now you need to understand, Satan is not out to necessarily destroy you as much as he wants to dominate the world through men that are yielded and surrendered to him. To these, he promises that they will know good and evil. But on the flip side, God, the Lord of all glory, power, and authority, he declares that life lived on that principle, that life lived on that principle will bring death. And so God says one thing. Satan says the another thing. Satan says, believe me, yield to me, accept the principle of self-existence, self-sufficiency, independence of God, and I will show you life. But God counters and says, believe him and you'll die. But believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. 
The whole of your life here and your destiny in eternity depend on what you believe. What do you believe? Now, in this spiritual warfare that's taking place, there's one, one factor that weighs heavily in Satan's favor. And that is simply this. The human race basically has submitted to this principle. In every human heart, he has an ally. And there is that within each one of us that will go along with this principle of evil. All because of a nature that's born in sin and demands its self-existence and self-dependence. Demands that independence, if you would. There's also another factor in this spiritual warfare that weighs heavily against them, not only for him, but against him. And that is, of course, of human history, which is abundantly proved that the tragedy and the disaster which God said would happen if we rebelled against him, and if we allied ourselves with the enemy, it has, and it will continue to happen until he's defeated. Human history also tells us that heaven has launched a full-scale counterattack against this destructive principle of life. That's sin nature. And it was launched in the person of Jesus Christ. And in spite of all the efforts of Satan, even battling with Jesus face to face, at the cross, Jesus conquered those principalities and powers convincingly. And he conquered death. And he sits at the right hand of all power from where he shall reign until every enemy becomes what? His footstool. This mighty counterattack from heaven against all the powers of darkness is a factor which weighs heavily against the enemy. Yet in spite of it, Satan self-successfully blinds the minds of those who don't believe so that the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ is not seen by them. They can't see it. Search as they might, they can't see it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. It tells us he holds the world's unconscious in his arms. He holds the world unconscious in his arms. The New King James Version says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of of the wicked one. What a predicament. A soul made in the image of God, unconscious in the arms of the devil. That's the world we live in, guys. And so it makes sense that the hostility of Satan is never put against the unbeliever. Why? Because there already is. But as far as the man who has revolted from his rule, who has turned to God in Christ Jesus, and has found himself by that blessed act of the Holy Spirit that he is now, she is now free from the grip of the enemy. He finds or she finds themselves now free to do the will of God, free not to live as he pleases, but free to live in submission to the whole principle that God has laid down. And in living that way to find his liberty. And all those fiery darts that the enemy is hurling at the believer simply because he or she is indwelt by his divine nature. Satan's deadly enemy. The attack of the enemy against the Christian is not against flesh and blood. We've learned that. We know that. But it's against our relationship to Jesus Christ. Listen, guys. Satan's primary concern is not to make a Christian fall in moral impurity. Not at all. In fact, that would defeat his object. Rather, his desire and his goal is to make the believer fail in prayer. To make the believer to be bankrupt in their testimony. To make the believer be defeated in their spiritual life and deprived forever of being a channel able to communicate God's principles of light unto this world. And it's at this point that we see the transformation of the devil. He transforms himself. How? Herein he does. Again, your adversary, the devil, 1 Peter 5 8, as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. Number one, he transforms himself into a roaring lion. In Bunyan's book, he writes of Apollyon, 
in this way. Now the monster was hideous to behold, clothed with scales like a fish, wings like a dragon, feet like a bear. And out of his belly came fire and smoke. His mouth was as the mouth of a lion. And that's how Satan comes to us sometimes, isn't it? Undisguised, hideous, an evil monster ready to devour us and to throw us down. But as such, he's very easy to detect, isn't he? It's kind of like going out on Halloween and you see a red suit and horns. You go, hey, I saw the devil. That's not what he looks like, though, guys. You see the transformation here. Undisguised, hideous, an evil monster. You know, that's easy for us to detect. And if he always came in that way, we could take our sword out and just beat him down, couldn't we? But Paul speaks of the devil much more seriously. And in many passages of Scripture, he refers to him as a serpent, one who comes with subtlety and guile. Listen to his language. For 2 Corinthians 2.11, we are not ignorant of his devices. Devices, guys. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the what? The wiles of the devil. So the devices, number one. Number two, the wiles. And then number three, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. The snare or the trap of the devil. So to Peter, a roaring lion. To Paul, a serpent which beguiles and still fascinates men with the glittering eye that he has. And then slowly winds his slimy length, coil by coil by coil around their lives. Because he fashions himself or transforms himself as an angel of light. And that is exactly what he once was. He was an angel of light, the light bearer. And oftentimes that is what he pretends to be today. That is what he was before creation when he rebelled. That is what he pretends to be while still living in rebellion. He offers men light on that principle. And by every counterfeit imaginable, he offers a way of life without any relationship with God. You want to come with me? Come. But have no relationship with God. The thing that we need to remember, guys, is that the thing that we should be concerned about the most is not the onslaught of nuclear bombs, but the collapse of the whole moral fiber from inside. The things we are fighting today is not over in Iraq, it's not over in Iran, it's not over in North Korea, but it's right here where we live. Our enemy is not flesh and blood, but it is a spiritual foe. Notice the strategy of the devil. He has the world blinded by his system. And so where is the focal point of his attack? It is upon the Christian. It is upon the family. And it is upon the church. For his only enemy really is the divine nature. Jesus Christ. Who only lives in born again people. And for that reason. Satan's first and foremost priority. His primary target is guess who? You. You are his target. Now, he attacks in three ways. We'll get into a little bit more practical things. The first way he attacks is in the realm of the Spirit by false teaching. Paul has been really dealing with the Corinthians on this. I mean, just look at our text. If he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye received another Spirit which ye have not received, or another Gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Or verse 13, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. In other words, the first basic attack of the enemy is in the area of our soul by means of false teaching. False teaching. Why do I stand up here and say, read your word, read your word, read your word, read your word? Why am I constantly reminding you in studies for you to be students of the Word of God? Because that's the primary 
basic attack that comes to us and comes our way. He wants to do you under. He wants to wipe you out. And the first means that he uses is false teaching. There's no doctrine which is free from his attack. When Satan attacked the Lord, you'll recall he used the word against Jesus. Psalm 91, Satan is skilled at preaching a form of religion based on scripture and using many of the doctrines of the Christian faith. And by the way, he uses them better than probably 80% of us, maybe more. Every doctrine of the faith except one. There is one that he is deathly afraid of because he knows it is this one which will defeat him. We read in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, as the whole universe celebrates the triumph of our risen and returning Lord, they overcame him by what? Anybody? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. How did they get the victory? How did they win out? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. If there's one doctrine that Satan cringes before, it is redemption by blood. It is justification by faith and not by works. It is atonement by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the free grace of God that puts a man right by God's merit, unmerited favor and not by our works to achieve salvation. His grace, guys. And because Satan is afraid of us, he does his deadliest work by not ignoring this basic doctrine. What does he do? He perverts it. You're not worthy, guys. That's what he'll whisper in your ear. And then he makes this precious truth of the gospel an excuse for self-indulgence. All the way until you have no Antoninians. Those who deny the lordship of Jesus Christ in their lives. Saying today, you know, it doesn't matter how you live. All your sins will be washed away by the blood of Christ. And Satan would, if he could, deceive the very elect. Antiminians is an old word for old heresy. That's growing proper, uh, popular today. One of a sect who maintained that under the gospel dispensation, the laws of no use or obligation are those who hold to doctrines which supersede the necessity of good works and virtuous life. Always seeking to make the true gospel something that it's not. There were very few things as we look at Paul's ministry and we look at his life that would cause him to cry. He had the Roman whip upon his bare back, but he ignored it. And he was glad that he was counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. He could be in the midst of the Mediterranean storm, driven to shipwreck, but he praised God and believed him for deliverance. He could have the executioner's sword raised above his head, about to be beheaded. And he could say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. But there was one thing that would bring him to tears. There was one thing that truly broke his heart. It was when he saw men take the gospel of the grace of God and make it an excuse for sin, saying, let us continue in sin that grace may abound. Of, Paul, of that, Paul says, I tell you, even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Philippians 3.18 One of Satan's most effective and damaging attacks on the church today is in the area of its witness to make it abuse the gospel of grace and cause it to allow people to continue in sin and yet say, I'm a Christian. Exploiting the grace of God. And so the areas of false teaching and in the areas of the word of God. Secondly, the enemy attacks in the realm of the imagination by unholy thinking. There is no gift as wonderful as that of our imagination. It can rise to great heights but there's no curse so degrading as an imagination which is defiled by the enemy. Satan, who knows exactly the moment to attack, will come with full force at the best time. He'll come 
to us at the time of sickness and depression when we're low in spirit and we're low in health and he fills our mind with doubt, fills our mind with questions. He'll fill our mind with self-pity. And when we are well, when we're strong, when we're prosperous, he fills our mind with self-confidence. He fills our mind with a self-love or a self-admiration in times when we relax and seek rest in our mind and we're not watching and we're not alert. We are vulnerable. And he will come at those times and fill our mind, our empty mind, with foul thinking and imagination. Or when we seek the face of God in prayer, he'll invade the holy place with thoughts of which we are desperately ashamed. For every mood or condition, he has his weapon and it's charged and it's ready. But the most subtle of all, are the moments when he withdraws Satan. When he, Satan, withdraws altogether from working on you. Firing his darts, you're left numb. No longer do you have a love for God's work. Doing it only because you have to, perhaps. You're not finding any sweetness in the, in the Word of God. You may be stirred by the Bible study occasionally, but never stirred into action. That's taken care of five minutes after service by the conversation that takes place. You are completely without any inclination to the things of heaven. You're unmoved by the most powerful message except a slight stirring in your conscience. Life turns into a duty. There's no hunger. There's no longing for God in heaven. You seem to be just cruising along spiritually without life. And Satan has conveniently withdrawn. He stands back and he watches the soul that he has ceased to tempt because he does not need to bother. And you might think, hey, no, I I think that temptation is hard. And I agree. But I'll tell you what's worse. What's worse is when Satan stops bothering you. What's worse is when Satan leaves you alone without troubling you at all, alone and and with no heart for the things of God. If you are just going through life with no reality, no power, no grace, no hunger for God, everything a duty and a performance, to you I would say something very radical. Listen carefully, guys. You need to go to God and you need to say to Him, Lord, let the devil loose on my life again. That's a dangerous thing to pray, let me tell you. Because he will do it. And so false teaching and the word and the imagination being transformed. Then thirdly, Satan's transformation into an angel of light is in the realm of conscience by self-interest. Dressed in the attire of heaven, he can make himself to appear as the very voice of heaven. You sometimes find it hard to know whether it's the enemy or if it's the Lord that's talking to you. It is not always easy to know when you are being clearly led. Satan is always working in the realm of conscience, seeking to cloud the issue, seeking to jumble things up for you. And when self-interest would call for me to go in a certain direction, he would tell me, yeah, go for it. Have you ever heard him say, hey, go ahead. There's no harm in it. It doesn't pay to follow Jesus too far, he would say. After all, you've got to have a good time, you know. And he's continually coming against us, continually whispering in our ear. And so by false teaching, by imagination, by consciousness, our conscious sake, the Christian is deceived by Satan, transformed into an angel of light. Now, one of the most amazing things about him is that He is so united. He has thousands of agencies all ready for his use. And meanwhile, the church of Jesus Christ is quarreling and fighting, but there's no civil war in hell because all Satan's hosts are united on one full-scale attack upon the place where he can find the nature of Christ dwelling there, the heart of the believer. God help us. 
For when that happens, Satan has a field day. And so what's the answer? I've presented to you the problem. I've presented to you the different causes of the three main causes. What's the answer to it though? This struggle that we're in, this battle, this warfare, Satan's attacks. How do you detect him and overcome him? First, I need to remind you that his fate is sealed. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 11. His fate is sealed, but we don't have to look into the future to get the victory. All we need to do is go back to the cross and look at the one who cast from himself principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. Colossians 2, 14 and 15 says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The defeat that was predicted when the Lord promised that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 it actually has happened as Jesus himself said in John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. You say, but Joe, what about today? Good news, guys. There is victory for us now. Because we're told greater is he that is in you than what? The he that is in the world. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse uh, 10 speaks to us about putting on what? The whole armor of God. There's victory in that. That we might do what? Stand against the... We heard it already. Wiles of the enemy. We also have the word that gives us all things pertaining to life and to godliness. Lay hold of God in his word, guys. Saints. Sheep. Lay hold of God in his word. As you have never done before. For the man who is soaked in the word of God will always have an answer ready for Satan in the moment of temptation. As Psalms 119.9 says, Wherewith, uh, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. But understand that the word of God is not magic. A lot of people want that little magic wand, wand that they can wave and make the problems go away. But it's not magic. It all depends on your approach to it. If you approach it to submit it to your intellectual criticism, you're going to be in trouble because you will never know the victory. But if you submit yourself to the criticism of the book, then you will discover the power of God to defeat in you the power of the enemy. It will happen. Secondly, what should you do? Well, you must not only soak yourself in his word, but you got to run to him. Run to him as hard and as fast as you possibly can. Run to his living word, who has made unto us freedom and wisdom. This battle is not with flesh and blood. We know that but it was spiritual forces. And therefore, it requires spiritual weapons. And the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. The sheep are never so safe as they are when they are near the shepherd. We are never so secure from the fiery darts of Satan as when we are near to Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it means walking in the way that he walked. It means living daily in his fellowship. 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. It means trusting always in his blood. For the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. And Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That promise doesn't only mean one day in heaven when we shall see him face to face, but that means now. In the heat of the battle, in the intensity of the spiritual warfare in which we're engaged, in the light of the world conditions that are constantly 
a challenge to us. It is not only that we will see God in heaven, but we will see him now and have the spiritual discernment to know which is which. Amen. We'll have that victory now. God will do that work in our lives. We live today in a world that's on fire. We see national and political corruption. We see a church that in many ways is lethargic, disunited, worldly, tripped up by the angel of light. So what can be done? Shake off the shackles. Break free from the fetters. Snap the chains. And lay hold of God as we have never laid hold of him before. The Lord wants a chance to answer the fire of hell with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And he will do this very thing for you because it is the only hope, the only answer. The Holy Spirit on fire in the lives of God's people is the only hope for you and I as believers and for the world that we live in. Give God the opportunity, guys, to answer the fire of the enemy with the fire of heaven. For then, and only then, the power of Satan cannot prevail against you. Go now into his presence and say, Lord, please put on the armor for me. For I have no might and I have no power against all these who come against me. Neither know I what to do. But my eyes are upon you. Amen. Father, let us like Gideon of old be clothed with the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Lord, go before us. Give us a charge. Give us the strength to go forth as a man or a woman who has captured the word of God and who has been captured by the Spirit of God. For Lord, only as revival comes to individual hearts can disaster in a nation and disaster in a church be averted. Father, we shouldn't be surprised when false teachers seem to live so righteously, when their standards seem to be so moral, when they stress the importance of family and separation from defilement of the world. We shouldn't be surprised that their TV commercials sound so right and look so warm and fuzzy or that their temple glows with light. For Paul says Satan himself, Satan himself transforms into an angel of light. And once again, Lord, I pray that, Father, we would place ourselves on the altar, presenting ourselves, Lord, and that, Father, you might Take that opportunity, Lord, to not conform us to the world, but transform us by the renewing of our mind. Lord, do your work among us now. Father, fill us with the power and the might of your Holy Spirit. That, Father, we might be a weapon a tool in your hand. Rise up an army for you that's ready to fight, that's ready to put on the armor of God and to be that warrior. Speak it to our hearts even tonight or this morning, Lord. Speak your truth, your desire. Oh Lord, you are worthy. And we just submit ourselves to you now, surrendering our will. That, Father, your will might be done. We love you and we praise you, Lord. And we ask God for this in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Let's go on and continue to worship the Lord. Ushers, if you'd come now.
pray that you'd be with us as we go our separate ways today. Give us traveling mercies. Take us to our places of abode and bless us this week. Help us to be a shining light in a dark world. Help us to speak out for you. Help us to keep the faith. Help us to fight the battle. Lord, uh, be with those who are in the need of a touch to you today. Bless them. Heal them. Strengthen them. The offering that was given, we pray that you would bless it, multiply it, use it for your glory, and for your ministry. Again, thank you for all you've done for us, all you're going to do for us, and keep us to that perfect day. These things we pray in your most precious name, and as we get ready to leave, everyone says, Amen. Love on one another a little bit, saints, and may the Lord bless you. <clears throat>